My name's Tom Evans. I'm a professional ultra distance trail runner from the UK uh, and have just got back to the UK after winning Western States 2023. Nice, man. And you, you ran a few years ago and took third, right? Correct. Yeah, I ran in 2019 as my debut 100 miler um, in, the, yeah, in a very fast year and was behind uh, Jim and Jared. Yeah, can't complain about that. That was a fast year. It was interesting to see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> nice. it was so, crazy. Yeah, so what we're going to do then today is we're just going to go over your um, pre-race strategy for nutrition, uh, race day nutritional strategy, and then also recovery for post. Um, so let's but, just jump right so, into it. I think like I think people are interested in hearing about it. So what did you do like on Friday night, um, or just Friday um, before the race? Uh, I'm just putting up my. Uh, I get. I suppose yeah. I suppose the first thing like, I'm very, I'm very very specific with nutrition, and I don't have a bad. I've never really had a bad stomach in training. Um, or in racing, but I think it's a combination of, yeah, training for it in and around training as well as around races. So, yeah, I'm very specific. So the day before, I don't know if this is going to be on, if the video will be, but, like, I basically, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. It might not even yeah, come up. Not show up. Yeah, it's, it's not even. But, yeah, I basically get a whole... Oh yeah, it's not going to work. But like a whole spreadsheet of this is what you need to eat at this time, and it's ba it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's like if we go from lunch on the Friday, so because the race starts early at five a.m. and I'm warming up from like half four, everything almost gets pushed like a meal before so i end up like having breakfast pretty early on the friday lunch pretty early then dinner pretty early and then go to bed pretty early and then have breakfast on the saturday morning pretty early so like lunch is yeah rice 300 grams of rice um so yeah 425 uh calories of rice which is 95 grams of carbohydrate um an egg uh, and some morton um just with 40 grams of um carbohydrate in so it's all sort of pretty boring food it's all very beige or white um and i i, I cut fiber out from of my diet like three four days before a race and i think the amazing thing for that is what fiber does is it sits in your stomach and it holds on to water. So as you, I think talking about sort of race weight is a really difficult thing. Is it almost, it's almost become a bit of a taboo subject in and around endurance sports now. Um, I definitely do have a race weight uh, and I don't train at my race weight. I get to race weight three weeks before I race, I then have my final big week of training at race weight. And then I go into my taper and I put, I put weight on that will be like next to nothing and predominantly just water weight as I reduce training and it start to increase carbohydrate. But then as soon as you cut fiber from your diet, you lose that weight and more automatically because it's just water weight that's just in your stomach. Um, so yeah, so that sort of goes into it, maybe not from the exact day, but from sort of the logic going into, into the race. Um, and then, uh, like, in the afternoon, I, I'm a big fan of smoothies. Uh, I drink a lot of smoothies sort of in training, uh, and it's sort of become a, yeah, pretty regular thing. So we like to keep it sort of as, yeah, as close to a normal day as possible. So... I make like a nitrate boost smoothie um, that's like some beetroot juice, some apple juice, some frozen mixed berries and a tiny bit of spinach. Um, so that's like 150 calories with yeah 30 grams of carbohydrate in um, midway through the afternoon. And what, uh, yeah, what um, nitrates do is it helps the vasodilation. So your veins and arteries sort of open up so it helps to yeah flush your body through with 
more oxygenated blood. So one, it helps to recover, helps recovery, and two, it prepares you for endurance. Um, is the theory? There's been quite a lot of good science out of a big university in the UK, the University of Exeter, um, on the use of nitrates um, in sport. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so like second snack throughout the day is yeah, super boring. It's just a a big bottle of Morton. Um, so a three twenty drink mix. So um, yeah, eighty grams of carbohydrate, just over three hundred uh, calories. And then dinner again, super boring. Um, chicken breast with some rice, a little bit of olive oil, um, and a small a small bottle of Morton. Um, and then just before I go to bed, I'll have uh, two pieces of toast with jam with no seeds, um, and that's it. And I'm ready for bed. Like I cut, I cut caffeine out of my diet for ten, seven to ten days before um before i race just so then when i do take caffeine the morning of the race and then during the race my tolerance isn't built up because now i'll have a coffee or a red bull and at the end of a training block i just don't feel it at all like 100 milligrams becomes nothing um whereas after 10 days of a taper and sort of cutting it out your diet then yeah, you really do feel it. Like I don't get a bad stomach off it, um, but I do feel it. And then race morning itself, like I've just had the most, it's just the most simple breakfast ever. So I wake up early and I like to have, I like to finish my food three hours before the race starts. So had um, literally like 75 grams of, 75 grams of cornflakes, the cereal, is 277 calories with some semi-skimmed milk it's 118 calories uh teaspoon of sugar uh and a slice of white bread with jam with no seeds um again all, all super boring it's super white and beige um and then so, so i got a question then real quick before we jump into actual like um like fueling strategy for your for western states how did you come up with this strategy of like one cutting out caffeine, two having such a bland day or two of eating, and then three like in the drink mix adding into it? Because I think a lot of people obviously like will try to cut out fiber and stuff, but it seems like you're still consuming like a fair amount of carbohydrates and simple carbs as well. Like, is this trial and error, or did you guys do some Red Bull testing, or what was up with that? Yeah, I've done a little. I guess a bit of a combination of. I think a lot of people when they think about carbohydrate loading. They, all you've got to do is just consume more carbohydrates. Whereas a lot of people, what they will do is they will start to, in order to consume more carbohydrates, they will consume more volume of food. I don't necessarily want more food in my body. I want to take the food in, absorb all of the carbohydrate, turn that carbohydrate into glycogen, and then for my muscles to store as much of that as possible and with something like Morton having it in a drink it means that I can consume more carbohydrate for the same amount of volume as food to what I'm used to I think a lot of people will say oh I don't know why I had a bad summer and you sort of ask okay well what was your carb load it's like oh like I ate I just ate so much rice and so much pasta and it's like do you normally eat that much before you train it's like no never and people say don't do anything different in a race that you're doing training it's like so well why have you just messed your race up by eating twice as much rice as you normally eat um so i think and i think it's yeah so we've done yeah a little bit of testing with red bull a little bit of testing with morton uh, and seeing like some of the values from that has been super interesting and yeah and i think for me race day is like a it's like a training session like i don't want to put that much stress and that much pressure on it because it's no different to how I train. Yes, it's longer. Yes, it's harder. Yes, it's a bit faster. But the same principles apply. And yeah, it's the oldest saying in the race book is, yeah, don't do anything new on race day if you haven't done in training. So all these crazy things that people try, eating loads more food. If you don't do it in training, then 
why should you do it on race day? So yeah, we found that just using like a really simple sports drink is yeah the most effective way in yeah making sure that your body has got as much glycogen in the muscle as you possibly can because that, yeah. Yeah, that's what you want from the carb load yeah exactly that makes a lot of sense and it seems like a lot of people just just because of the dogma i guess like have always just like oh, i'm gonna have a bunch of pasta the night before the race whatever then they just feel like garbage the next day like bloated and have to go to the bathroom multiple times so that yeah, makes a lot of sense exactly like it's yeah it's really like when you think about it like it actually makes it pretty simple cool i want loads of carbohydrate but the least amount of food in my stomach as possible okay cool how can i do that through drink um and that doesn't mean that you're drinking gallons and gallons like it's super clever now the amount of carbohydrate you can get in half a liter of water that you couldn't do properly five six seven years ago and now it's like especially with morton with a and yes i'm sponsored by morton so i would say that it's great but i used it before i was sponsored um and if i got dropped by them i would continue using it um it just allows me to yeah allows me to fuel correctly when i need to um which yeah which i think is yeah i think is critical yeah definitely what about electrolytes are you topping those off like the few days leading in as well or you just kind of do the average no not really we did try a little bit of like sodium loading um there is yeah there is such contradictory science with electrolytes of if you're a salty sweater it's like what came first did you did you put more salt or more electrolytes into your body so your body then sweats out more to try and keep the balance the ph balance in your body neutral or because you've sweated out loads of electrolytes and then you, that means you need to put more in but because you put more in it means you're going to sweat more out but like without delving too much into my state's um nutrition plan like i had no extra sodium i didn't take any electrolyte pills i didn't take any form of electrolyte drink mix except what is in um what's in my sports nutrition nothing extra oh that's really interesting so then I guess think or jumping back more to race day then, like you said, you tried to finish your your last meal three hours before the event. So with the 5 a.m. start time, were you up at like 1 a.m. and then eating at 2 a.m.? Yeah, it was super early. I was up at, I, I sort of organized everything pretty well. Like I had, I had already poured out my cornflakes into like a Tupperware container. So, so it didn't get, um, uh, it didn't get all soft. And then, yes, yeah, so I literally woke up at, eight i think it was like eight minutes to two and then yeah stumbled into the kitchen poured the milk in got the bread went back to bed ate it in bed um and then actually managed to get back to sleep for sort of 45 minutes before waking up again um i then do eat again um again with morton um like a sodium bite the their new sodium bicarb products and like sodium bicarb has been on the market for more so for track athletes for ages and there's yeah, a lot of research into the effects of sodium bicarbonate on lactate levels um the big problem with sodium with consuming sodium bicarbonate is it's super unstable especially in your stomach and typically leads to having a really bad belly like two three hours after it but what the clever thing is now is they have created a, a transportation system, a hydrogel that allows the sodium bicarbonate to move through the stomach and then be absorbed in your intestine. So you don't get a bad stomach from it. And there is, there is a lot of research on it, but it's not all, um, it's not completely, uh, it's not 100% saying, oh yeah, this is a complete game changer. But I think for running a marathon, I don't think it would make any difference. But you see it a lot now in like long stages in the Tour de France, people who are using, the riders are using, especially the GC riders and sprinters are using bicarb. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of trail runners like at UTMB last year, both myself and Killian were using bicarb before and during the race. Um, I think what it does, it allows you to go over your, 
lactate threshold and for your body to start producing more lactic acid than it can get rid of quicker and more effectively than your body can at a time. So you're almost, if let's say, if at 160 heartbeats a minute, your body starts producing more lactate, more lactic acid than it can get rid of. What this then allows me to do is to run at 162, 163 beats a minute, creating the same amount of lactate. So it's almost you move your zone one, zone two, zone three, all like up a couple of beats. Um, where I've found it super beneficial is at altitude um, because running at altitude, it shifts your zones anyway, or your paces because everything's harder because there's less oxygen. Your body's having to use more glycogen in order to fuel your training. And then like you look at, yes, you want to be as fat adapted as possible and use the most amount of, you want to be burning oxygen and fats making that into your energy sources but sometimes it's not possible and in a race like western states it definitely might not be possible um so where i find sodium bicarbonate really useful in the race um is i'm able to make a surge in a race and then recover quicker than anyone else can so i look at yeah how the, this race went i made a surge in the race that worked uh, and i was then able to still run it just outside seven minute miling and recover. Um, do I owe that 100% sodium bicarbonate? No, but even if I owed one or 2%, if it makes a difference uh, and have seen the data, have seen the results, not just in other athletes, but have ha after having done tests with Morton, um, yeah, it makes a, for me, it makes a huge difference. Um, yes, it's slightly, it's slightly high risk because it can, influence your stomach a little bit more but at the same time in my opinion the risk is 100 percent worth the reward um so yeah so taking a step back so i need to consume all of that 90 minutes before the race starts um so yeah so at western state so i had my breakfast at two and then went back to sleep and then woke up at so just before um 3 30 and then made it then yeah consume that still in bed and then after that it was it was time to get up uh and then open a can of red bull and sort of just started sipping on that to sort of get a little bit more carbohydrate um and then 80 milligrams of caffeine in just before the start nothing crazy not too much but enough to yeah settle my body into taking caffeine again and um yeah get ready to start a very very small very very leisurely warm-up um because yeah, the start line in Olympic Valley was um, it was absolutely freezing. Yeah, I think it's funny when people. Um, I think the states is always being hot, but this, the initial start is pretty cold, and there, and you climb up to the top of the escarpment, and it can get pretty chilly pretty fast, especially this year. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was wild this year, and um, everyone knew that it was going to be cold, and I had slightly planned on wearing a jacket to start with, but. Yeah, I sort of changed my mind fairly last minute after doing a warm up, and just thought actually a t shirt and sleeves is will be will be fine. I live in I live in the UK. It's normally pretty cold here, so uh, five degrees in um, Celsius, uh, yeah, isn't isn't too bad. I've run I've run in far less in far colder, so uh, yeah, fairly normal. Definitely. So let's kind of walk through your uh, your race day strategy then. Like, so the gun goes off at five. And are you instantly consuming um, drink mix or something on the climb up or what's kind of your strategy like throughout the day? Yeah, exactly. I think I definitely used to follow more of a don't start fueling straight away because as soon as you start fueling, as soon as you start using carbohydrate, your body then relies on carbohydrate. Um, but especially when you're at altitude and a climb and the start of the race and you're in snow, regardless of how fit you are and how fat adapted you think you are, if that's even a thing, it's impossible not to use carbohydrate. Um, and if you start depleting your sources at the beginning, it's like having a, it's like having a slow puncture on a bike. You might be all right for a while, but your energy is leaving. The air is leaving your tire bit of sealant in it might stop it for a little bit but it's just going to keep coming out and coming out and at some point it's going to explode um and you're going to have a flat and you've then got to stop 
you've then got to change your tyre, bump it back up, and that takes time. And while you've done that, the peloton's gone 10 minutes down the road. So, yeah, I start pretty much from the beginning. Um, it's actually why I started the race wearing a pack. I didn't want to start. The plan was to use handhelds and a belt for the whole race, and we'll go on that in a little bit. But for the start, I wanted my hands to be free because I knew that there was going to be heaps of snow and I knew that I was going to fall over and I didn't want handhelds in my hand to yeah, limit what I could do with my hands. I wanted to be able to hold on to trees if I needed to, or put my hands in the snow and get a bit of grip if and when I needed to. So I went for a pack, um, yeah, with two 500 milliliter bottles, um, one with a strong, one with 80 milligram, 80 grams of caffeine, one with 40 grams, not caffeine, 80 grams of carbohydrate, and one with uh, 40 grams of carbohydrate, um, and then a couple of gels as well. 20 minutes in, I think definitely running uphill, you're using more muscle, you're recruiting more muscle fibers in order to climb. Um, plus in the snow, running in snow is like running in mud. Like you end up using a third, 33% more energy running in snow for the same effort as running not in snow. So it really can tear your race apart if you're not fueling. It's also cold. So your body is having to work harder and to use energy in order to keep your core body temperature warm. So even if you're used to running for an hour and burning let's say 100 grams of carbohydrate in those conditions you're probably burning 130 140 grams of carbohydrate so in order you, you've got to put that back in so whereas a lot of people ask or have asked like oh how many grams of carbohydrate did you average during the race it's like yes i do have an average but my first the first three hours of the race i consumed significantly over my average than I did in the hot sections of or the hotter sections of the race because it's far easier to drink sweet drinks and to consume things when you're cold compared to when you're hot. Um, so this is definitely something that like we practice quite a lot in training. So I would con I'd, in training I'd be consuming I'd do runs where I'd have like 140, 150 grams of carbohydrate an hour which is a lot and more than I took in during the race on average, but I would do that first thing in the morning in Flagstaff where it's cold in order to practice it. Um, because I knew that that's what race conditions were going to be like on the day. Um, and you've got to train. If I've learned anything from this last training block is the more uh, you have to train for the demands of the race. And if you're not training for the demands of the race, then you're not training for the race. Um, so by doing these sort of earlier morning runs, it was just, yeah, it made it just second nature when the race started. Like I didn't have to worry about, oh, am I, do I, am I, do I feel all right to consume enough? This is, this is way more than I would normally take. I'm definitely taking more carbohydrate than anyone else in the race is taking. Like, yes, I'm a bit bigger and a bit more muscular, but, I'm considering, uh, yeah, I'm taking consuming significantly more than other people. Um, but like they did a, there was a, um, yeah, a survey done after Ironman Kona last year with the top 10 men and the top 10 women. And there was a direct correlation between position and amount of carbohydrate consumed during the race basically the more that the more carbohydrate that you are able to consume the better you are going to do to a certain extent um so that's what we trained for we trained like i did utmb last year with 90 grams of averaging 90 grams of carbohydrate a year whereas at western states this year i uh, my average was 120 grams of carbohydrate an hour and the first three hours were at 150 to 160 grams yeah, that seems like a, a lot, but obviously it, it works, but like, it's interesting because a lot of people are shooting for like maybe 60 to 90 where you're almost like 75% like, higher than that. I think you'd, 
depending on the conditions and depending on how hard you're working, like if it's not going to upset your stomach, having an excess isn't a bad thing. Like you're just going to, if you don't consume it, you're just going to pee it out. Um, which isn't the worst thing because you're keeping your body to, to its normal process. And I think there are some people who do it, who do far better off lower carbohydrate. But what I find is on a high carbohydrate training diet, like touch wood, like I've not had a niggle in the last six months. Not, I've not had one day running where I thought, oh, this is a bit sore. This is a bit tight. I then recover, I recover so much quicker because my body's not running on empty at any point. Um, like if you go out for a five, six hour run in training, like you're, you are depleting your body so much and you're then, you're probably missing a meal and then you're probably never going to quite recover from that, missing that meal. And you end up to just slowly running yourself into the ground and, yeah, not having enough carbohydrate and then getting a niggle and so on and so forth. It just builds and builds and builds. So what I found by yeah consuming a high amount, a higher amount of carbohydrate in both training and racing is that I'm so less susceptible to picking up these like repetitive strain, tendonitis, tendinopathy injuries. And it's been, yeah, there has been, again, there's been a direct correlation between the amount of carbohydrate I consume and the reduction of tendinopathies that I've had um whether they're related at all or it's just been pure coincidence um yeah who knows but um yeah don't fix what uh what isn't broken um and yeah for me it works I can yeah I can get off it um yeah yeah I know that makes a lot of sense and I think I think a lot of people, even though they think they eat a lot, are not eating enough still, just kind of average runners. It's like it's like a lot of people think like, oh, I'm overtraining, I'm too tired. It's like, no, you're probably just not eating enough or not eating enough nutrient-dense food. 100%. Like people ask, oh, do you plan a rest day? I'm like, no, like I don't, I don't need to. I end up, like I don't plan rest days in training, but I'll take them when I feel like I need to. Um which is probably once every five weeks, four or five weeks, when slowly I'm just getting down and down and down and I have a whole day that I can ping everything back up to where it should be and then sort of just slowly decline. But and I think by, yeah, by fueling correctly, you're able to do that rather than from fueling incorrectly and just being tired, your body then starts breaking itself down in order to fuel itself which is what happens when you run out of glycogen stores especially if you're operating at a higher intensity when your body's not capable of burning fat your body then starts eating soft tissue muscle in order for it to fuel itself with enough energy and if you do even if you just do that for 10 minutes a day every day it's just slowly depleting and depleting and depleting um like the majority of runners will go out for a 90 minute run and not even think oh, i don't need to consume anything it's only 90 minutes but your body's only you're probably one you're probably going faster than you think you are and you're probably using way more carbohydrate than you think you are you've only got 500 grams of carbohydrate stored in your muscles before it runs out and you then have to start using a different fuel source a lot of people after an hour of running are going to have burnt through that 500 grams pretty quick. Um, so then you, your body is just breaking itself down in order to keep fueling. So I would so much rather, yeah, fuel my body correctly. So I'm one, I'm ready for the session and then two, I'm then recovering as quickly as possible. So I'm then ready for the next session. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense because you don't want to like, obviously like destroy your body. You can, whatever um yeah let's just jump back in into the race day then so like you're at robinson flat 50k ish in um at that point you jump did you go to handhelds and go that way in that direction um and then what how'd your feeling my, change my plan was to switch 100 percent to handhelds but for some unknown reason um i just had a really like 
gassy stomach. Um, yeah, nothing would, without delving too much into the detail, nothing would come out. It was just so gassy. Um, and I was planning on wearing a naked belt, which is obviously quite tight on your on your belly. So I just sort of thought at the time, right, well, there's no point in changing anything. It's not, this hasn't got any worse, my stomach, but I, there's no point in trying to aggravate it. So I switched to handhelds, but I kept the pack on. Um, and then in the pack, I could just put ice in the back panel. Um, and even though it wasn't hot, being able to keep yourself as cold as possible is going to be super beneficial later on in the race because yeah even though it's not hot it's still warm in the canyons um and you're still getting a lot of sun exposure so yeah just making trying to be as cool as possible so actually i think if i was doing it again i'd probably do the same strategy and i then i then had a pack with handhelds in from yeah from robinson flat to pointed rocks okay. <clears throat> and then how did your um did that like change your nutritional strategy then like even though it wasn't super warm did you start going to more um more drink mix at that point or would you kind of do it was it's pretty much split um down the middle i consume so yeah so for 100 the, for the majority of hours i was on in and around 120 grams of carbohydrate every hour and for me that's one bottle of drink mix and one gel, so gel being 40 grams, bottle being 80 grams. So it's super easy to remember. Um, and I think for me, that's sort of the, yeah, that's been a little bit of a game changer rather than having sort of smaller gels or not as much drink mix. And in something like Western States, like you don't want to over drink. So typically I'd have, for me, the aid stations from after Robinson Flat come around about after every hour or a little bit less so what i would do is i had two handhelds one with carbohydrate drinking one with water um and then a, and then gels so it meant that i had to carry a little bit less so yeah so i'd leave robinson flat and then i would just be sipping on the carbohydrate drink mix and then when i needed yeah just some plain water when i felt like some plain water i'd drink that and then normally sort of every hour, either on the hour or on the half hour, I would take the gel. When I then knew that I was approaching the next aid station, I would drink as much of the carbohydrate drink mix as possible. Um, I wasn't just going to down the whole thing because if, if, I, if I hadn't drunk it, I hadn't drunk it. Um, there's no point in just trying to yeah, just chug it all when you're stood there. So what I would then do when I knew I was approaching, I was would try and drink it. And then in the water, in the remaining water that I would have is I would already start preparing that for my next carbohydrate drink mix. So I'd take the powder out of my pack, open the packet as I'm moving along, not very quickly, but jogging at as a eight thirties, I would then pour the powder into the drink into the bottle and I used a amphipod bottle because I think they've got the biggest openings at the top. So it just makes it super easy to pour, uh, to pour the uh, carbohydrate drink mix into. Um, and then when I then got into the aid station, I would just empty the old carbohydrate drink and just say to the aid station volunteers like, Hey, can you just please fill these both up with water? And then that's me done. They then do that. I can then put the my trash in the bin. Uh, and then I'm then, yeah, I'm then good to go, ready to leave. Yeah, it seems super efficient. And I think a lot of people overcomplicate like a lot of aid station strategy, like at least in like yeah. pack runners and stuff. And it's like, yeah, like it's, it doesn't have to be very complicated. It's just know what you're going to do and then have it ready. Yeah, I think, I think the most simple is the best way because there's then less things that can go wrong. And I, I definitely think that you need a backup plan because sometimes things might not go right. And it might, if you're in the mid or the backpack, things are going to take way longer. And actually it then becomes way more difficult to consume. Yeah. Maybe you won't want, geez, if I was running for 25, 26 hours, I wouldn't be on 
gels and drink mix, um, I'd be on, I'd take more solids because you're out for such a long time, you're missing so many meals. Whereas I think if you're fortunate enough and you've got the ability to run quicker and for it to take less time, then I think you definitely simplify the nutrition strategy. Um, I did have, I did have some solid. Um, we've been trialing over the last, uh, pretty much since UTMB last year, consuming protein mid run. Um, and the science is, and the data is suggesting that by consuming small amounts of protein every sort of three to four hours during a race leads to a slower breakdown of muscles. So you're not getting sort of the tiny microscopic tears in your muscles as quickly, especially in a race with so much downhill. So you take a race like Western States, for example, where there are yeah, serious downhill stretches. So like after Robinson Flat, for example, you've got like a 13 mile descent. So being able to take three to five grams of protein before descents like that have shown in theory to reduce muscle damage massively. So I have a, yeah, it's like a protein bar from Morton. Um, I don't think it's out on the market yet, but I think it's pretty soon to come out on the market that's broken into like three chunks. So it's got it's got 15 grams of protein in the whole bar, but it's really like easy snackable chunks. So I know, cool, if I eat one of those, it's five grams of protein. Um, so I had, yeah, 15 grams of protein throughout the race. I think an hour like four, eight and 12, I think I had some protein um, and not much, not enough to, to rebuild any muscles, but just to help delay the process of, muscle breakdown yeah i know that makes a lot of sense and i've been hearing a lot about that recently it's interesting to see that you did that at states yeah yeah really yeah, yeah. it's been yeah it's been it's been fun uh fun playing around with it yeah no, that's super cool so then um yeah i guess uh how did you dose caffeine then during the event were you taking red bull at certain times or what were you doing for that because i think a lot of people over consume caffeine or under consume sometimes as well definitely and it's like caffeine has the ability to raise your core body temperature. So sometimes it points in the race that you think caffeine might be most useful in and around the canyons. It's that's also when it's at the hottest. So yeah, playing around really is really gently with it. So I might sort of micro dose caffeine in the first half of the race. So I had, I had half a can of Red Bull at Robinson flat. So around 40 milligrams of caffeine so hardly anything um and then that then pretty much took me all the way i then had a tiny bit another half a can at um michigan bluff um before then getting on the road and that was again that was another half a can so another 40 milligrams and then from forest hill it was then a bit more aggressive so i then had a can at Forest Hill. I then had a can crossing the river, uh, Rocky Chucky, um, and then had a very, very quick sip at Pointed Rocks. So I didn't actually go crazy on caffeine during the race. So but typically I'll go more, I'd have more caffeine in an overnight race when you're just trying to sort of disrupt your circadian rhythm. Whereas I feel like for me in a race like Western States, like I don't think Jeez, you need a lot of caffeine in order for it. If your body has a, got a high metabolism for caffeine, which the majority of endurance athletes do because they drink a lot of caffeine, they consume a lot of caffeine, whether it's through coffee or Red Bull or anything else. Whereas the main reason why I massively reduce my caffeine intake before the race is I find that for, I feel a boost of 40 milligrams of caffeine. And then when I then consume 80 milligrams of caffeine, which really isn't that much, I feel a massive boost. Um, whereas the people who don't caffeine taper, you have to take loads of caffeine, which one, can increase your core body temperature, two, can lead to GI issues, um, three, is a diuretic, so it makes you pee more, so you can dehydrate yourself. 
So by having a caffeine taper, not only does it make the caffeine that you consume feel better, you're then massively reducing the risk when you take caffeinated products. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and just thinking too, like obviously this year at States was fairly cool compared to most years. Like you're still in the nineties, I think, but if it were say a like hundred degrees at Forest Hill, would you have toned back the amount of caffeine you, you were taking in? Yeah. And I think, I think I would have done it on feel. Um, if I was feeling, if I was not feeling great, I'd probably had the same amount of caffeine. Um, I would have rather had that caffeine boost and slightly risked increasing my core body temperature or try to cool my core body temp down in a different way but then again on the other hand if you're if you're feeling pretty good in the heat then yeah i would have just yeah i would have reduced the amount of caffeine i would, I'd have still taken some but maybe not quite as much okay cool yeah it makes sense then and so then as you were kind of coming um i guess past pointed rocks and everything closer to the finish did you just keep the same amount of carbs basically like i don't know as far as your average goes or did you kind of change anything up at that point no, kept everything exactly the same. Still from, from pointed rocks to the finish line, I had 120 grams of carbohydrate. Um, I had a whole bottle of Morton 320 drink mix. I had a sip of Red Bull at, at pointed rocks and then had, yeah, 80 grams in a bottle um, and a 40 gram gel. Um, the race isn't won until you cross the line. Like you can still, the wheels can fall off. Um, and actually I had, yeah, I had 25 minutes, but you start walking from no hands up the whole climb and you walk the whole way from no hands bridge to the track someone's putting 25 minutes into you um so yeah i fueled i probably had my last sip of drink when i got to roby point um and then from there last mile in yeah things aren't gonna fall off hopefully you're not gonna fall off the wheel too much at that point but yeah up up until 99 miles i was fueling fueling as race plan um went in nice um so they like i someone mentioned to me on the live stream i think dylan was talking about it i don't remember exactly i was just i heard this from somebody um they said you were taking ketone esters is that something that you were taking during the event yeah um something that we had trialed in the build-up um yeah, again, there's lots of science suggesting that it works really well. And then there's lots of contradictory science saying that it's a complete waste of money. Um, like it's, it's seriously expensive stuff if you're getting the good, the right stuff that's, that's being tested um, alongside sort of the WADA laboratories. So yeah, I think it's, for me, when taking ketones, it almost felt like I was, if I was doing a low carbohydrate run and I took ketones, it felt like I was doing a high, a high carbohydrate run. Um, I think in trail running, it can be super useful. And I'm not sponsored by any ketone brand. I bought it all myself. I think I got given a 5% discount um, and just actually it's just easier to buy it outright um which is exactly what i did um and i think what it's what it more so does to me is sort of combined with the caffeine is it's more of like a brain stimulant rather than a energy source um i feel far more switched on when i'm taking ketones um whether it's a placebo or not if it does what it if it makes you feel more switched on like and i especially feel like for trail running that you've got to concentrate for the whole race whereas in a road marathon people say oh yeah get to like mile 16 and then just try and switch off till you get to mile 20 before it starts to hurt in an ultra marathon you can't the only place you could really switch off was running on the road from forest hill before you turned left down to cow one um the rest of the race you've got to concentrate where you're putting your feet and so to be able to make that, yeah, to be able to make those snapshot decisions quicker. And I think, yeah, using ketones is for that has been pretty helpful. So yeah, I'd done a, I did a loading phase in training um, and then took three, three ketone, however big the things are, Delta G ketones, 
um, three during the race. Um, yeah, lots of lots of cycling teams are using them um, and not necessarily advertising that they're using them because I think it is a yeah, it definitely is a new. It definitely is new. Um, but yeah, I think. Do I think it won me the race? No, but if it gave me one percent help, and I had trained with it all the way through in the build up, um, I definitely felt like I recovered better from taking them as from taking them as well. Like the, oh, it, it always sounds bad. Um, as soon as you mention EPO, EPO is a naturally occurring substance in your body. Um, yes, when you when you inject it into your body, that is not allowed. But there is now quite a lot of science suggesting that taking ketones in sport naturally raises your body's post-exercise production of EPO, which then allows your body to recover. Um, it's a very you're not taking EPO, you are not taking synthetic EPO. And I think EPO, yeah, it's in your body naturally in small amounts. And by taking something that naturally may increase it, like going to altitude, um, does exactly the same thing. It's like being at out, it's like going to really high altitude for two hours and then coming down and your body's sort of buzzing and making more red blood cells it's basically doing exact it's basically doing that job for you but without the risk in theory whether it's whether it helps or not who knows but um yeah i think it's uh i know lots of other endurance athletes who are using ketones and quite a few in in trail running like zach bitter for example he's been using ketones for oh, for a long time and he's he's done he's done amazingly well um is it purely down to ketones no but yeah i definitely think it can help yeah definitely and like in sports like example like like tour de france or something where like a one percent difference is massive and can be the difference between winning and doing nothing i yeah. think the benefits are there and like yeah the science is kind of all over the place but it is cool to see like more and more data coming out about the use of exogenous ketones in endurance events yeah i think it's i, I think it's probably the next it's probably the next big thing in performance sports um, or not just for perform, not just for elite performance, but it's another way that you can fuel your body. It's an, it's this, it's this other energy system that we can tap into. And there is, so, there is so much talk about sort of following a, a no carb diet in order to, become to produce these ketones in your body if you can do it by taking yeah don't get me wrong they're absolutely disgusting um but if you yeah if you can get that same effect without risking not fueling your body and you can create the same outcome legally um then i think it's a no-brainer yeah for sure i totally agree and you, I guess we're kind of wrapping up here. You touched on the recovery aspect or the potential use of ketones for recovery. So after you, um, you crossed line at States, you won. It was pretty incredible. It was cool to see. Um, what did you do as far as recovery? Did that start that night? And did you kind of binge eat or did you, um, do you have a proper strategy for recovery? Yeah, I try, I try not to binge eat too much. Um, I want to recover well. So yeah, I keep, I keep the things in my diet that I know I should. Like, and I try to eat the least amount of really, really inflammatory foods as possible. Um, but having said, so yeah, I'm still, I'll then start to put fiber back in my diet. Like I'll make sure that I'm replenishing everything that I've lost. So hydration first is probably the biggest thing and just rehydrating um progressively like i think after a race like western states it will probably take three four five days to rehydrate properly because you can't you just can't consume i probably lost like 14 liters of sweat during the race 
you can't just down 14 liters of water and think you're all right and probably kill yourself. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, by, yeah, just slowly, yeah, slowly rehydrating and then, yeah, food wise, that's the big one. Yeah. Just making sure I'm getting enough protein, fats and carbohydrate. Um, and I'm getting, reintroducing some colored food back into my diet, a few green things here and there, not too much though. More than just a bit of salad and a burger. Um, but for me, it's probably more it's probably more mental recovery rather than I think physical recovery takes care of itself. But after a big race that you have a great result in, I think the mental recovery can almost be as challenging, if not more so. And that's definitely something that's I don't think talked about enough or prioritized enough because yeah, I've, geez, I've been training for Western State since I got back from my honeymoon on the 23rd of December. Every day since then, I reckon I've thought about Western States for three hours a day. And it's now finished. <laughs> like filling that void. And yeah, yes, it could have been way, it could have been worse. And you didn't achieve what you want to achieve. But you've been on this roller coaster of a journey and you've then achieved exactly what you wanted to achieve. And it's just that sigh of, not a sigh of relief, but there's so much weight you put, I put so much pressure on myself that it just felt like a huge weight taken off my shoulders. So I just allowed myself to, yeah, to fully relax, to not be an athlete for a week. What are we now? Eight days. Yeah. Eight days after States and I've not run yet. Um, I've done a little bit of training. I've been in the pool. I've done some cycling. I've not run yet, and yeah, I don't feel the I don't feel the need. I'm not really craving it. Um, and so I just yeah, I keep listening to my body and just give my because I know as soon as I start running again, I'll start training again. Um, and I just want to make sure I give myself one enough physical time for recovery but two enough time to mentally recover before going into another training block. That's going to be as equally hard, if not harder. Yeah, definitely. Like setting yourself up for that next training block seems to be like vitally important. And it feels like a lot of people just want to jump right back into training. Like, Oh, I'm going to use my fitness that I've gained over the past however many months, but it's like, it can be detrimental to just kind of jump into it that soon. Huh? 100%. I think you just, yeah, you can jump into it and like, yes, you do lose you do lose a bit of fitness every day that you don't train, but you don't lose that much. Um, you might lose the feel and yeah, you'll get back training and you'll feel pretty rough for a week. But after that, you'll be at pretty much the same level that you were a month ago. Um, and I think, yeah, just being able to, when I want, when I'm ready to commit to a training block, I'll commit 100%. But if I'm not 100% ready, then I can't commit because you end up just in second best against yourself. And when things get tough, you're going to make the wrong decision and you're going to back away. And actually, I'd so much rather, yeah, take a week extra recovery or go, yeah, go a week longer with recovery rather than start training a day too early. Um, what's a week as a professional athlete who's been training full time now for since 2017. Yeah. I've got five or oh, coming up to six years of training on my belt under my belt. What's a week going to do? Um, if, if a week is the difference between me achieving or failing at my next goal, then I've got no hope. Um, it, yeah. It's as simple as that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so I guess on that note, as we kind of come up to an hour, um, let's uh, let's wrap it up. Like, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about that. The nutritional strategy is fascinating on, on how you did it and how you performed. No, thanks very much. Thanks for your time. And yeah, thanks for some, uh, yeah, some amazing pictures. And we met very, very briefly in the Grand Canyon uh, with Hayden and, and, um, and Danny Jones, DJ. So yeah, no, thanks so much for the time. And yeah, great to chat and look forward to seeing you at on the trails at some point very soon. Yeah, for sure. Maybe uh, someday we'll actually talk a bunch in person instead of just online. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Sounds good, Tom. We'll talk to you soon.